All right, so let's get started. Welcome back to, is it lecture nine? I'm actually not sure. Of like deep unsupervised <laughs> learning. <laughs> something, lecture something. Um, and so we will have a two part lectures today. The first part, we will look at something um, called unsupervised distribution alignment. It also goes by a lot of other names. Um, and then the second part would be a guest lecture by Professor Al Aliosha to talk about some of, I guess, the works from his lab. Um, so, any logistics questions before we dive into your lecture? Milestone of, of, um, of the project? Can we have late dates for milestones? All right, there you go. Uh, can, we, can we have more, more, more credit for the project? More what? Uh, more, more Amazon credit? For yeah, we'll publish more credits for the project uh, later in the year tomorrow. For the final project, you're right about getting to $500 credit, I think. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, it should be pretty good. <laughs> be high Amazon will be very generous. <laughs> <laughs> Which no one is working on. <laughs> All right, so, so let's get started. So um, in this lecture, we will look at um, unsupervised distribution alignment. So what does that even mean? So let's remove the part unsupervised. Let's just f first look at a distribution alignment problem. So a lot of um, problems in image to image translation take this form. So let's say I want to go from semantic mask to RGB images. Then this is a distribution alignment problem because we can think of us having a um, distribution over mask here. And then we also have a distribution of like just regular images here. Um, and then they would like co-occur with certain joint probability distribution. All right. It's mostly for one image, there was only one correct semantic mask, but for one mask, there could be many corresponding images. Um, and the goal would be like, how can you align these two in such a way that when I give you an image on the right, you can generate the mask or the other way if you want to generate more training data. Um, and then the more image problems that takes this form, let's say I want to um, know an image, what does it look like in the daytime and what does it look like in nighttime? And then again, we can think of it as having a distribution of images of daytime and then also a distribution of images in nighttime. Um, and then you want to align them in certain way. So you say, why is this helpful? Like one way that this could be helpful is say, if we want to train autonomous vehicles to drive safely at night but then it's harder to collect training data at night. So is there a way for us to collect corresponding images during daytime and then find a way to find their nighttime counterpart? That would be useful if we can do this. And then there are some other, a lot of other problems also fall under this formulation, like black and white images to color images. Um, and for basically everything that we have seen, they are relatively tractable because like, I can totally just take a color image and then convert it into black and white. And that gives me a lot of pairs that I can train on. Um, and uh, similarly to the um, semantic mask and uh, street view RGB images, as well as daytime and nighttime. Um, for a lot of those, you can actually find natural pairs. So these are some of the problems, distribution alignment problems in image space. Um, and this kind of distribution alignment problems also happen in um, they're, they're text analog of that. And the most straightforward example is really just um, machine translation. How do you translate a sentence or a paragraph from one language to another? That, again, you can think of as a distribution alignment problem. You can think of there's a distribution of English text and then there's a distribution of Chinese text. And then the question here is how do you align these two things together? So when this kind of distribution alignment problem, when it's supervised, then 
they are relatively easy. Um, so when in the in the case of from an image goes to semantic mask, it's basically just semantic um, segmentation problem. Um, when it's like other image to image translation, there's this text to text work that's done here um, at Berkeley. And then for text to text domain uh, alignment, when you have the supervised pairs, it's just machine translation. And when you want to go from image to text, again, when you have supervised pairs, they are just like captioning task and a lot of things. So in the end of it, it really just boils down to feeding a certain conditional distribution. Like you give it uh, image B, what is the correct mask A? Um, and the, you have this luxury is when you have kind of A and B pairs that co-occur in the real world, um, either through your annotation effort or by taking an image at daytime and then take the same image at nighttime. As long as you can gather this kind of pairs, it's somewhat trivial, at least from a um, formulation perspective. It's really just fitting a conditional distribution. And we have talked about all sorts of ways to fit distributions in this class, GAN, autoregressive model, flow, whatever. And, but the question becomes interesting if um, this kind of pair of data, what if they are expensive to obtain um, or they just don't exist? Then we are basically going out of the range of this supervised distribution alignment problem. Like you have one distribution, you have another, but you don't have any pair of data. Um, then like, can you still do this or even do it at all? So I'm taking some examples from a paper called CycleGAN. Like, what if you want to turn a painting into a photograph or turn a photograph into a painting? The second one might be more tractable because like, you could possibly say, I, I take a picture and then I hire someone to paint it for me. But if I want to do it in a very specific style by a specific artist, then you really couldn't do that. So in a sense, the natural pairs don't even exist in the real world. Um, Similarly, like if you want to, for whatever reason, if you want to turn a zebra into a horse or turn a horse into a zebra, then it would be very difficult to force a zebra and a horse to take up exactly the same pose and take a picture of them having um, the exact correspondence. So these are the kind of pair of um, um, data that would not exist in the real world. Um, and there are a lot of other applications. So let's think back to machine translations. So if, we want to, if I want to translate between Chinese and English, or English and Germany, that's relatively easy because um, there are large demand of those language users, and it makes it economical to annotate a lot of data of basically supervised language sentences pairs. But then like, it's not economical to do it for the um, the other probably hundreds of languages that exist in the world. It just doesn't make sense to annotate that much data. Uh, and, and if we can make this kind of distribution alignment to work without any supervision, then it could be used as a lot more, uh, it can be used as a way to augment label examples in a kind of semi-supervised way. And it can be also used to do style transfer, like some of the things that we have seen that basically had no ground truth in the real world. Yes. Well, it's just, okay, so if I have a good translation model between two languages, then the value of that model is kind of proportional to the usage that you can get from it. Let's say to train any pair of languages, you need the same amount of investment. Let's call it $50 million, probably on the lower side. Um, then like, if I throw in this $50 million for between Chinese and English, you probably get a ton of usage and you get ads or like what other revenue. But then I have like English to like whatever language that probably only 100,000 people speak. Then you get drastically less usage of that model. That means for the same investment, you get a lot less out of it. So it's not that they are more expensive to label, it's just like their value doesn't make it justified. Um, so okay, so let's look at this problem again. So it would be, of course, it would be a nice thing to be able to achieve to give me two distributions and then find a way to align them. But is this even a feasible problem? Like, so 
if we look at the problem statement, we are basically told to do two things. One thing is we have distributions A, we have two random variables A and B, two distributions, and then we get access to the samples from them. Like we get a bunch of samples in one domain, we also get a bunch of samples from the other domain. So that's all great. But what we crucially don't have is we don't have any samples from the pairs. Um, yet we need to estimate how they are related to each other. Um, so this problem from a um, high level seems pretty hopeless because you are really given too little information to, um, to tackle it. So what we would look at next are um, kind of certain, so basically the, the crucial problem now is like where do we even get any training data? Like if I don't have any supervised pairs, like what do I even train the model on? Um, so the, the way that people have been doing this is they try to rely on certain invariants that are true for kind of any pairs of distributions. And then somehow you could get some meaningful learning signal out of it. So the first kind of invariance that we can rely on is something called marginal matching. So there's some math here, but then the brief idea is really, like if I want to translate um, one distribution from one distribution to another, after the translations, the distribution should still look like each other. Um, and more precisely, what it means is that um, there is some fundamentally unknown um, coupling, uh, there's some fundamentally unknown relationship between these two random variables A and B that we are trying to approximate, but we don't have access to them. So let's call that our approximation Q. So given B, like what, what A is most likely, um, well, this is the other, this should be. So basically, we were trying to learn two mappings or two conditional distributions. And when you specify this kind of conditional distribution, distribution Q of A given B, you implicitly induce a, a marginal distribution. So when I specify Q of B given A, I'm implicitly specifying a marginal distribution on B. Um, and the way that you compute it is if I sample A for my ground truth distribution of A, and then you essentially average out this conditional distribution, um, that would be the marginal distribution of B. And ideally, I want my Q to be close to the ground truth conditional distribution P of B given A. And that means um, if I sample a lot of A, and then I map it through my conditional distribution, the outcome of that should map back to the original ground truth distribution. And similarly, I can do that for A. So I sample from B, and then I would from, um, from this B samples, I would calculate my approximate conditional distribution. And after those transformations, um, they should be the same as original marginal distribution as A. Um, and oftentimes in literature, this conditional distribution is just a deterministic mapping. So I would say, give me um, any sample from A, I would map it to its corresponding sample in domain B. So far, so good? Yeah. So assuming and Q is like some neural network, yeah. um, even though it's doing something that's like dependent on A or like using some new information, yeah. it seems like when we're training this, we're just going to be minimizing some loss between uh, the, you know, PB, mm -hmm. like what we actually have, and uh, the results of Q. So at no point is A impacting how we train like Q for B. So the, the question is, um, basically we have stated the question to be, um, in the end we are trying to match this marginal of B, approximate B to the ground truth B, which we have access to. But in no point you're saying the neural net Q needs to look at A, yeah. essentially. So that is a true statement. So if my Q, if my Q um, is so powerful that it could just represent 
the whole marginal distribution of B. So let's say, let's call, if we have Q of B given A, that is equal to Q of B for all A and B pair, then your statement would be true. Basically, you can just like approximate the marginal distribution without even doing any meaningful work. So that's why, like in practice, people would have a fairly restrictive mapping. Okay. So like that's why, like in most of the works that we would look at, like it usually takes the form of a deterministic mapping. So when when Q of B given A is deterministic, then like you don't you don't get to represent the whole marginal distribution unless P of B itself is only a point mass. But that is a correct observation. But like you, like you suggested, like I mean, this is a very weak learning signal. Like if you don't correct, if you don't construct your model in the right way, like you, you could extract nothing from it. So let's see some examples of like how, like how does this, how does this in an ideal case work at all? all right. So let's say I have two distribution, A, and B, and they are very simple categorical distributions that only have. Um, three possible values, A1, A2, A3. Um, I'm just going to draw some frequency here. Right, so, and then I'm going to do the same thing for B. So this is probability mass function. Right, so, so based on, let's say we have a deterministic mapping. That means like each of the A1 has, each of the A has to map to some B, and each of the B has to map to some A. Then like based on the marginal matching, like this can seemingly um, give us a way to recover the ground truth correspondence. Let's say the ground truth correspondence is between A2 and B1 um, and A3 and B2 and A1 and B3, right? So I would argue this would be the only correspondence that satisfied the marginal matching constraint. Why is that the case? Um, well, it could be not a bijection, but then like it might not fulfill the properties until unless some of the Unless some of the values have like no probability mass, then like you can do whatever. Right. So I argue this is the only way that you could make the marginal matching work. The reason is that because each value has a distinct frequency here. So if you match it in the wrong way, um, the marginal distribution of the induced mapping would no longer be matching the original one. But there's still a lot of ambiguity, right? So if we imagine a distribution that's like the most kind of the most difficult one, let's say I have a uniform distribution over two random variables, then this is kind of hopeless because all kind of mapping could work. So let's first look at the A to B mapping. So A1 can map to B1, A2 mapped to B2, but then it's also possible that A1 can be mapped to um, B2, A2 mapped to B1, um, and it would still be fine um, from a marginal matching perspective. Um, but then the problem is, um, so, so, well, then that means this thing is ambiguous. And this is not just, oops, sorry. I mean to draw it the other way. So there are two sets of mappings that we, are, we need to learn here. One is GAB, which is mapping from A to B. And then another set of things is, um, another set of things that we need to learn is um, GBA. And basically, you would need to learn the product of these two different possibilities. B1 to A1, 
B2 to A2. B so how many like totally possible solutions are there to this problem if we just use marginal matching? Yeah, so basically each direction there are two possibilities and then if you multiply them together there are four possible solutions in this problem and they are basically totally ambiguous. So this is one of the things that we are seeing here is you can have your objective function that induce a really large solution set. Really in this case is almost all of the solution set. And then people realize this can potentially be a problem. So they introduce another technique to try to at least restrict the um, um, solution set a little bit. So this thing is oftentimes referred to as cycle consistency, but it has also taken a lot of other names in literature called dual learning back translations. Um, and really the core idea is that if I, um, if I take my, so basically the core idea is that my approximate mapping should be similar to the ground truth mapping. And if those mappings are deterministic, then what that means is that if I step through my mapping, I should get back my original sample. Um, so if we think about the case of B of AB given, a, uh, given of A, would be this would map A to its correspondence in B. And then if you apply that again from the other direction, B to A mapping, you should get back A. Um, and this should hold true in both directions. Um, so this gives you another invariance. So if you say that the relationship between these two distributions are indeed deterministic, then I would say these things should hold true for all possible pairs. Um, and if we step back to the example that we just looked at, so if we impose cycle consistency, um, what would be the number of possible solutions now? Why, why is that no longer four? Yeah, so like we can see that in this case, the original total solution set is four, but after you impose this cycle consistency constraint, you can reduce the solution set that exists. Like some of the, some of the mapping are no longer valid. So let's say if I pick this and then um, pick this, this would be no longer valid because an A1 would get translated into B1, and then B1, according to this, would get translated into B a2, so this is G A B, this is G B A, and this is this no longer satisfy the cycle consistency constraint. So that means like I can use this constraint to reduce the possible solution set in my uh, in my search, but still like we can see that it's still fundamentally underdefined. Like we are still left with two possible mappings, and we are not sure which one is correct. Um, but it at least exponentially shrinks the space that is possible. So, so far we have seen um, the two core invariances that people have used. And um, these are invariants that are true for all alignment problems. And then we can use them as learning signals. Um, and again, like obviously, like we just look at, like even in a extremely low dimension, um, basically categorical examples, like it's still not going to work. So there are, there are definitely problems that this cannot solve. Um, but then in practice, like people can find problems that this kind of search is amenable to. And then you can oftentimes inject additional biases in your system by c selecting the right architectures, loss functions, and et cetera. And you can actually get to a certain level of success with this. Um, yeah. So can you explain more about the previous So the expect this this one basically says for an arbitrary data point in it's it's just a generalized version of the cycle consistency thing. So for any of the data point A, 
if I draw samples from my um, approximate conditional um, um, distribution, and then I translate that B back to A using my approximate ones, the, the distribution that it induces should be similar to if you do it with the real world one. Um, and um, what we're saying here is just that like when in the case of both of, when we say we know the P and the Q are both deterministic, then it reduces to the deterministic mapping example. But it could exist in a more general form. Um, so probably the best known example that uses those um, learning signals are CycleGAN. So CycleGAN's laws essentially consist of two parts. Um, one part is this marginal matching. So meaning after I translate my um, data from one domain to another, the marginal of them still match um, with each other. And you can kind of see it here. So um, essentially, my generator no longer takes a mapping from Z to X. Instead, this thing is trying to translate from X to Y. Um, and I want to do it in such a way that um, it looks like my target image. So this is just a standard GAN training loss where you're trying to say, my mapping from X to Y, it should look like just like Y. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, and so essentially, instead of looking at frequency, you use a GAN to help you do the marginal matching. Um, and the second dimension of this is you can achieve cycle consistency by um, an L1 loss. So essentially what there's, if we unpack this, ob um, this objective function is, you sample for data in one of your domain, probably your source domain, and then you map it through, um, you map it through a cycle, then it should look like itself um, in an L1 sense. Um, so this is, I think, what they call forward cycle consistency because it's going from X to Y to X. Um, and then they also have a backward one um, where you essentially kind of think of it as a sample from all your labels and then you map it through this thing again, um, Y through X through Y should be similar to itself in an L1 sense. Um, so that's the loss function. Um, and then you essentially would combine these two things together and then train it. Uh, I think in practice they use a least, I think they, in practice they use a least square GAN instead of the original GAN objective. Um, but probably it doesn't make too much of a difference. And so they reported a couple numerical results. Um, and the first results that they look at is, so in the case of going from photo to semantic mask, um, you can actually calculate the accuracy. So we can get a quantifiable uh, um, notion of how well the method is doing. So the method that we just introduced is called PsychoGAN. Um, and it's basically unsupervised. So you give it a bunch of street scenes images and then a bunch of semantic masks and then you hope them that they somehow align each other. And what this shows that they actually do pretty well. So um, a peg to peg is a fully supervised model. So the last row means you get you actually get pairs of um, image and their corresponding label. Um, so the last row should be read as basically an upper bound on the performance. Um, and then the cycle again um, by using no labels at all, it can actually do pretty respectfully. So like you can roughly say that 60% of the pixels are labeled correctly with the right, uh, uh, with the right class, with actually no even, with no information on how they should be related to each other. Do we have just of the images in pairs No, so there's, there's no pairs. So you, 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 train, you train the whole system with just a bunch of unordered images and then a bunch of unordered masks. And then it's learning to align them. Yes? So the performance of the cycle again tell us anything like, does it get better accuracy on like, let's say, say does it do well on cars and like on street signs? Like, 
Good, good question. I don't think they have that level of nan analysis, but I think that would be interesting to see. Like, what are the kind of things that are easier for you to align? What are the things that are not, like, a more tri uh, a trickier? Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of investor bias in like going from one person to another. Yeah. Yeah, so the, so the question is, um, there was a lot of inductive bias going from one image to another using a confnet, and then also using a certain discriminator that operates on a patch basis. So you kind of like do a kind of domain alignment per patch. Like, so you can think of it as having, it's, there's really a lot of training signal that is not captured by the loss function at all. Um, so unfortunately, um, we don't know the answer to that. So I, I guess what, what I know for sure is like if you just, scramble the image, like, like I mean just permute the dimensions in your um, um, image tensor, then I'm pretty sure it would do poorly. But then like, is, does that mean like this is not useful? Probably not, but it still means that we don't fully understand what are the inductive biases that are helping us. But that's a good question, yes? I think one is like, for images at least it works well if the shapes in the two different domains like match relatively. Like, um, like they had one good example, like force to zebra, like the shapes of those animals are pretty much the same, it's just the color that you're changing. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to do like, um, I don't know, like automobile to like a pickup truck, or like a giant truck. Or something. Right, so I, I guess, so, so the comment is around like, the, um, a lot of these translation problems like operate in a very local manner. Like you're kind of like saying, I just need to change my local pixels. Like when you go from zebra to, to, to horse, like you're just kind of changing a local texture as opposed to something that is global, which is presumably much harder. I think that's likely the case. Yeah. I have no idea. You can, <laughs> uh, you can ask Alyosha, who will be here soon. Uh, how does this result compare with supervised learning? So I, I think this is, a long way from supervised learning. So I, I believe supervised learning like this thing should, like I, I, I don't know, but I, I, I imagine this to be at least 95% plus. Um, but again, like this is not a correct comparison. I think the correct comparison is to compare cycle again with picks to picks because they use similar architecture, except one is supervised, the other is unsupervised. Whoops. All right, so they have some ablations in terms of loss function, although not in terms of architecture. Um, the ablations basically tell you what we sort of expect that like for one, like if you GAN alone, if you just do GAN alone, this is means you just do marginal matching. Um, so which is actually not bad already. Um, and then you can see that if you add cycle consistency in there, it helps you. Um, and there's something that's really puzzling. Like I'm really confused by what is happening here. <laughs> it just kills everything. I, like I have no idea what is happening there. Um, so I don't know. Um, and, and what's also interesting is that it doesn't always help. So uh, what we are looking at we're looking at going from photos to labels. And then they have another experiment that is going from labels to photos. So this is a much higher entropy um, mapping, whereas they still use just deterministic mapping. So you can imagine some, there might be something that is playing with that um, in here um, that I guess we don't, we don't fully understand. What's interesting here though is the evaluation map, uh, metric is pretty interesting. So remember here we are evaluating it from label to photos. So basically it's give you a semantic mask, how well you can generate a scene, but then how do you even evaluate that? Um, so they actually have a pretty clever way of evaluating that. So what they would do is they would run another pre-trained um, semantic segmentation network, um, fully convolutional network. They would run it on the generated image and then they use that to quantify the results. Um, so that is a pretty interesting trick to evaluate um, this mapping. So just like the inception score? Kind of like the inception score, except like in this case, like we, you kind of, yeah, it's kind of like inception score, but I think it's better than inception score in this restricted domain. 
Um, these are some of the other quite success cases um, where you translate from, I guess, a schematic annotation of a facade to a facade, um, going from edges to shoe, going from shoes to edges. Um, most of them make sense. They apply this to a wide variety of different um, problems where you, it's just impossible to get label pair. It's just like, well, I guess summer Yosemite and winter Yosemite, you can get pairs, although not exactly the same. Um, and translating apples to oranges. Um, like, just like we said, like this is, it's, it's not, <laughs> Like since it's not supervised and it's not fully unique, um, they have their set of failures. And in this one, what the authors explain in the paper is that like, I mean, when you train on, <laughs> well maybe it's a success, I don't know. Um, when you train on horses in ImageNet data set, like, they're, like they, would, they have not seen a human riding on it. And as such, like you would just classify all similar texture to be horses, and then you just translate that. So, like this, um, this I guess goes back to one of one of the questions that someone mentioned. That's like, what are the failure cases? So, like I think this is one good example of like what it fails on. Like I think this is a good example of what the model is doing is is trying to find like yellowish pattern, and then change that yellowish pattern to stripes. Um, so that's apparently what the model is doing. Um, so that's that for cyclegan. So essentially, it's pretty surprising that it can work on certain domains. And when it works, um, I think it's fairly reasonable. Um, so the next thing that we would look at is um, we'll look at improving cycle GAN in certain dimensions. So the crucial dimension that we would look at here is that remember when we talk about the cycle GAN, the cycle GAN has this deterministic mapping. So you give you an image x, you translate it into domain y, um, and but this translation is deterministic. But that is um, fundamentally not correct, at least for a lot of the um, alignment problems that we care about. So let's say if I want to go from mask to image, semantic mask to image, like there's a lot of different ways to satisfy the same um, semantic mask. There are a lot of different ways to generate that image. Like semantic mask only tells you there's a car here, but what does the car look like? What's inside the car? What color it is? Like it, it specifies none of those. So basically there's this high entropy mapping going from semantic mask to image, and that is apparently not deterministic. So you can say, oh, one straightforward way to extend cycle GAN is to say, Cycle GAN is essentially this, right? So you take in an image A, and then you're trying to map it to image B. Um, so one straightforward way to extend that would be to make this mapping take in an additional noise source, just like in a typical GAN. Um, so you could take in an image A, and then you can also take in a noise source that probably describe like what does the car look like, what is the color other than the contour, everything other than the contour. And then from that noise source, you can map to some image B. And then if you sample different Zs, hopefully you get different cars. Does the motivation make sense? So that's all good. So and in fact, like this has been done um, concurrent to cycle again. There's another paper called Dual GAN, where this is essentially the architecture. The mapping would take in both an image from source domain as well as a random noise source. Um, however, this is not enough to just change your architecture um, because if you change, if you, even if you change your architecture, the noise are doomed to be um, um, ignored. And to see that, the reason is essentially our loss function, the L1, lo the L1 cycle consistency loss, tell it to do the following. So if my map my A with certain Z, this, this produces like some kind of B for me. And then if I map my B with another Z prime, I should get back to A. And we can see that in this whole mapping, um, the choice of Z and Z prime are essentially ignored. So you can choose different Z or Z prime. 
you still need to satisfy this mapping. So what that means is that the noise source is necessarily um, ignored when you impose a cycle consistency loss and when you optimize it to its fixed point. So that's not good. Um, and then there was this augmented cycle GAN paper that proposed a way to solve it. Um, so you would augment the noise to your architecture, but you will also learn. So instead of only learning the mapping from A to B and B to A, you will learn an encoder of each of the noise source, not dissimilar to how an encoder is used in a variational method. And it's actually pretty interesting. So the way that you would go is I have some ground truth image A, um, and I have, um, then what I'm going to say is that my ground truth image A would come from a corresponding B and its corresponding noise source, ZA. And then I would have this blue arrow, which is a network that infer what ZA it is. So basically, I'm trying to infer what Z produced my A. And I'm also going to infer what B produced my A. So instead of only inferring what is my corresponding B, I infer that as well as what is the noise source that produced me. Now, with both the noise source and the corresponding B, I can use that to map it to an A prime um, using this color, which is the mapping coming back from B to A. And in the end, I can say that A and A prime should be similar in L1, um, in L1 law sense. So now it's OK, because I'm choosing a specific Z for each particular data point. So if we think about it from an information theoretic sense, whatever information that is not captured in B, you push it into Z. That allows you to perfectly reconstruct the original image, as well as um, maintaining the ability to um, have diversity of mappings, because a different A could come from different C. Yes? How do you prevent the model from pushing everything into Z? So the question is, how do you prevent the model from putting everything into Z? Um, so you could, but it might fail the marginal matching criteria. Well, the marginal matching just says you need to output like a distribution of B that looks good, right? Right, so I guess the, the, the statement that. is like it, the A and B relationship could, could become decoupled. Like I, I, from A, I would just map to an arbitrary B yeah. that actually has no correspondence with A from the yeah. beginning. The but then like, remember, that is always the problem. Like even with the original cycle again, you could still produce an arbitrary mapping that is consistent, but it's not the ground truth mapping. So this, like, I guess what I'm saying is this doesn't make it worse. Yeah. Uh, could you do like a movie where you have like a distribution match after a cycle? Like distribution just by having a Z? Like rather than having like an L1 loss? Um, sorry, can I say that again? So like you map like So are you saying like basically you can play this multiple steps and then like the evolution of them should still match the original marginal distribution? No, I, uh, I guess I'm not fully sure. I'm saying like you take one loop and then the result of that becomes your like detached noise. Uh, yeah, yeah, more like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, yeah like, that's, it's like if you're just mapping. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. Yeah, so. There are many ways that you can play with this. Yeah. I just a little confused because, like, to me, this looks like A to A prime just looks like an autoencoder going through Z, yeah. and then you also have like something else that goes A to B, right? And you have like whatever some gain loss on B. Yeah, you would have gain loss on B, and then you would. I think you also have gain loss on Z, which like Z you restricted to be the marginal of that you restricted to be some Gaussian or something. So in a sense, you cannot put infinite information in there. So both of them are, in so a sense, like a information regularized. Yeah, good go. Ahead. Okay, so that's just like a VAU, right? It's, it's really more like an adversarial autoencoder, which we didn't cover in the lecture. 
So it's kind of like a VAE, but instead of like a KL loss, you use a GAN loss. So it, it is more. It is, but, but like a, it is very much like a latent code model that well, is trained with again. Like, I just don't see how like why the model wouldn't just collapse to that. It could. <laughs> I'm not saying it wouldn't. <laughs> like that applies to everything that we will go over today. <laughs> there are holes in all of them. Well, maybe it's because VAEs just don't work as well as GAN. Oh, you mean why they don't use a VAE? I think it's probably the mapping from A to B that it wouldn't do well. Like it wouldn't do it in like a visually appealing way. Um, otherwise, I think for Z, they could actually use a VAE type of loss. But it, it would not be a VAE because there's still this thing that it's just in the middle. Uh, on to that point, but doesn't the VAE start generating stuff like way before the GAN does? So then in like the life cycle of training this thing, it would be able to like take the VAE path while the GAN path is still underdeveloped, and it seems like at that point it might shift into a VAE. Because I just can't, at the end of it, yes, the VAE path will be worse than the GAN path. But it seems like from the homework that we did, the GAN path takes so long that you know, it's going to be <laughs> seven hours of training to take the last one. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not that fair comparison. I would say though, like if your data set is small, like GAN training is usually pretty fast as well. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, but that's off topic. Um, so just like operationally, what does that mean if we go through like one cycle of that, well, cycle consistency loss? So we get some um, image from some, um, from a source domain. And then we would randomly sample a Z for my mapping to B. Um, because remember that the mapping from A to B is also stochastic. So B could take up a lot of different forms. And then I'm going to generate a noise source that dictate what it is. So this is what I'm going to sample. And then there will be a set of mappings that I go through. So the mapping from A to B, now it takes A and a noise source for B. That gives me B. And then from this B and A, I can try to guess what was um, the, um, the Z that has generated my original A. So that is my encoder to guess Z of A. And then finally, I would plug in the B that I generated and the Z that I generated. And from these two, I get back, um, I get back this A prime, which supposedly should be close. Um, to my original sample. So that's all good. Like it's fairly easy to implement, like just a small surgery on um, cycle again. Um, how well does it do? So the, fir the first thing that you would want to run is essentially um, you would want to first give Z as the additional input to the mapping, which they call stochastic cycle again, I guess. Um, so that is without changing the loss function, like without introducing the encoder, is what this column that we are looking at. Um, and, and then the test here is, we sample an edge map for my ground truth data here. And then I would fit it through my cycle again, but with different Z terms. So this is, imagine this is coming from Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. So this is surprising, right? Because we originally, we went through this argument of like how um, just changing cycle again to make you, uh, to have, to take in Z wouldn't actually make use of Z. Like it would just ignore it. But what we are seeing here is actually different, right? So you give it an edge mask and it actually generate diverse samples for you. So, that's interesting. Like if we look at like say this shoe, like apparently they are all different colors, um, and even though we do the augmented one, like using the new loss function and the encoder, um, I would say they look probably the, about the same, the same kind of diversity. But then it's kind of interesting. Like why why does why does cycle again work? Especially like this is highly contrasting with the analysis that we just went through. So 
if I, especially if I take a black shoe and then map it to its semantic mask and then map it back, then if I get a white shoe, which is according to here, is something that could happen. If I get a white shoe spec, I'm going to incur huge L1 loss because black and white are just two ends of the spectrum in your color space. So, so that is somewhat puzzling. Like, what, what is this actually doing? Like, if, if it can generate this diverse samples, then that means it's not optimizing its cycle gain loss well. But it is optimizing its cycle gain loss well. Um, so the very interesting thing here is that um, cycle gain, when you go from a high dimension, like a high entropy mapping like RGB images to a low entropy one like a semantic mask, it can actually hide information in some kind of high frequency pattern. Um, so this is what we are. This is what we are seeing here. So like, like going back to the 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 black shoe example. Like when you map from a black shoe to its edge pattern, like it would give you like sim a, pl a seemingly plausible edge patterns, and then add some high frequency noise to it that they know that this is coming from a um, black shoe, and then it can look at the rough shape of that pattern. And then it also reads the high frequency noise that's encoded in there to say, oh, this should be black. And that's how it manages to still do the cycle consistency. Right? So I, I, I consistently get the same color back by hiding imperceptible information um, in sort of my mask on my edge. And that's pretty interesting. Um, and um, the way that you can show that it's doing that is by essentially constructing an experiment where you, um, so, so this is called domain A, this is domain B. You get the B out, and then you try to sample different Z that, you try to fix that uh, B, and then you try to sample different Zs. So if this is coming from a cycle gain loss, then you will see that the mask itself, even though seemingly it doesn't encode color information, it's implicitly encoding color information. So if I take this mask that's come from my model, I would have color information hidden in it in such a way that when I sample different Zs, you always get the same output. And that's how it's able to um, still satisfy the cycle consistency constraint. Um, and, so, and then if you do the augmented cycle gain loss, um, what you will see is that the mask looked basically the same, um, but there are seemingly less information in there. So when you sample different random noise source Z, you actually get um, different color of shoes back. Do you know how large Z is? It seems like all that encodes is color. So is it only like a couple hairs or something? I don't remember. That's, a, that's good to check. But like, I, like, I guess like as, as we have discussed, like if Z is very powerful, then potentially it can encode too much. So I think, I think that would be a balance there. And this is kind of doing the cycle walk. This is um, somewhat interesting, somewhat similar to what we had discussed. So map it from A to B, and then B to A, A to B, um, while I cycle through different noise source. Um, and then if you do this kind of random walk in an um, auto augmented cycle again, you can see that even though the, um, the mask stays relatively the same, um, the overall appearances, some of the other color texture does change over time. Whereas if you train it with the original cycle gain laws, you will just get the same pairs um, repeated again and again. So that's a somewhat interesting, a, in my opinion, relatively simple and elegant extension to cycle gain that helps you to deal with stochastic mappings. Any questions on that before we move on? So the next set of questions are, um, can we do better? So, so far we have covered two learning principles. One is marginal matching, and then the other is cycle consistency. And um, I guess it's a good question that whether those are the, all of the invariances that we can rely on, or are there additional learning signals that we can derive from it? It's a good open problem. And if we step back and think about this whole problem, um, it's really 
align two distributions without knowing what's inside is just really difficult. Um, if we if we um, think about the categorical distribution that has even probabilities, like it's just impossible to align them um, because we treat them as pure black box, like all values are the same as each other. So um, one idea that we can move forward from this point is we can look inside the random variable. It's we can say this image is not just a huge, a high dimensional random variable to me. Like I can actually look inside and see what's in there and then um, maybe use that to help us. Um, and for this kind of high dimensional A and B, like they typically have certain structures in them that, um, that could be leveraged. And as people have pointed out, like when you use a confnet um, and patch-based discriminator in a cycle GAN, you're kind of implicitly employing um, some of this inductive bias already. Um, but I think we there are cases where we can push this even further. So um, the best example that I could find is in NLP for that. So let's say domain A is all English sentences and domain B are all French sentences. Then we can imagine that like I can get a random sentence from all English sentences and a random sentence from all French sentences. They might have the same empirical frequency, um, but they might be totally semantically unrelated, which is likely to happen. Um, so, and cycle consistency wouldn't also rule out that either. This is just uh, basically going back to the um, problems of when you have distributions that have uniform densities, nothing could help. But what we do know is that each sentence is made up of words. Um, and it's very unlikely that in those two totally semantically unrelated sentences, um, they would have words that um, have same kind of statistics. So I'm using the term statistics loosely here. I'm going to say more about like what we can do with this. So basically what the exercise that we have gone through is instead of thinking of it as um, distribution alignment between sentences in different languages, if we are allowed to look inside like what's within each random variable and look at their subcomponents and do some influence on the subcomponents, that can help us circumvent the problem of um, not enough learning signal. So in the case of NLP, the subcomponents are the words and the, large, and the larger higher dimensional random variables are sentences or paragraphs. And so that's interesting. So like now what we can do is we can, for one, we can first of all align the words. Like we can think of ways that you can do distribution alignment on words. And even more, we can think of, um, we can make use of how different words occur together. So let's say the word I is most likely to be followed by M. And because these two things co-occur um, most frequently in, um, within this large random variable, um, Sen a, a sentence. So what is the thing that we can make use of this kind of co-occurrence statistics of subcomponents? Well, we have learned one of them, what to vec, in two lectures ago, probably. Um, so just a recap on sibgram what to vec. It's really simple. So basically all it's trying to do is, it's trying to say, um, given one word, the word in a sentence, I'm going to say that um, Others, other words in this sentence is more likely to occur than every other thing in my corpus. Uh, and in practice, you wouldn't sum over all of your dictionary. You would do some negative sampling to optimize this. But essentially, the end result is certain vector that describe um, if two vectors are close together in that vector space, then they're more likely to occur in a sentence. Um, and if you train a very, very large model on a lot of text data, then it capture how different words are likely to occur together. So let's skip gram. And what's really interesting is that this kind of word to vec method exhibits really interesting um, vector calculus. Um, so this is again a recap slide. What we can look at is that um, if we look at the direction um, from um, a country to its capital, um, the vector is actually relatively similar across a lot of these different pairs. 
Um, and we might, we might be able to ask, like, so based on this kind of um, vector, if the vector calculus makes sense, then does it mean that we can say the vector representation of those words are distributed in a certain manner? And more importantly, if similar cal vector calculus holds true for all languages, meaning I train a word embedding for English, let's say, on the, on the left, and I also train a word embedding for Italian. If they exhibit the same vector calculus, meaning um, all different embeddings in them are placed together in a such a way that you could um, do the kind of country to uh, capital translation, then that's a really strong inductive bias for us. Um, and if that holds true, then we can possibly align words by similarly, by just like uncovering some kind of affine or linear transformation that align these two things together. So very surprisingly, um, it's actually true. So for the word to vec that we use, let's say in fast text, um, if you train it on one language, if you train it on multiple languages, and then these embedding space, they are only a rotation away. So you're going to learn a rotation matrix that rotate another language into your space. And then the results would be, well, this, this is um, graphics that I grabbed from a Facebook blog post that illustrated really well. So you basically get this embedding space that, um, that exhibit similar relative structure. Um, and then, so what you can do, but the absolute location is undefined. Um, so what you can do is you can just learn a way to align them together. And then after the rotation, one point in the embedding space um, would be very likely to exhibit the same word, but in different languages. So this, this totally blew my mind that this could work, but yes. So do you have some like labeled like, pairs of words and then you use that to learn the Yeah, so, so initially, so the, what, what the citations here are, you can basically use a small dictionary, a, a language to language dictionary. You can use a small dictionary to learn the alignment. So it is, it it's still supervised. But the search space is much smaller. Like instead of going from each word, map to a neural net, and then map to another word, you would be like, every word is already represented by some embedding. Now I'm only learning the rotation that is used across all embeddings. But then like, so basically a couple data points is enough to, to specify that. Yes. I don't know. Probably two two thousand, I would I would guess. Like I mean, totally uneducated guess. I, like I'm not an NLP person. It could be pretty big, yeah. So that's pretty interesting. So that's what happened up until like probably, before two thousand seventeen ish. Is people can, like, you can align these two embeddings by is basically examples. Like I can just go to like, French English dictionary and then look up a couple words and then you use that to to align these two embeddings. But well, that's really cool that you can do that. Question? Yes. Um, so why is there like even scale is not a problem? What? Is if, if one of the embeddings is scaled differently from the other one? Uh, apparently, they are scaled the same or less similar enough. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, and then there's this recent paper that. Um, proposed a, a way that you can, oh. Actually, another thing that I forgot to mention is, so, um, oh, actually, this is it. So basically, that's a supervised way to align this word embedding, right? So that's, that's really interesting that you can just capture that by a simple rotation. Well, probably not simple, but a rotation. Um, um, and what this work has done is to show that you can actually do that with really good performance in an unsupervised way. Um, so now I have two embeddings space, um, and then you are aligning them uh, um, um, without any training signal. So the way that it's done is actually basically just using the principle of marginal matching. So you would similarly apply, so basically you your rotation, each of, each possible rotation basically specify a mapping. 
And then you're going to say, after the mapping, um, my marginal distribution still match. And then they just train that with adversarial training. So like again, like a loss to make sure that the marginal is specified, uh, is, is, uh, the marginal is matched. And then after they do that, but one of the results of possibly due to gain training is usually not very robust and high precision. So after they do that, they have, they have found a rotation that roughly aligned to distributions. And then after they have that, they would um, select some top pairs of um, high frequency words in those um, rough alignment. And then they would tr assume that they are actually ground truth alignment. And then you would use those as like actual um, pairs to, to solve for the exact rotation. And apparently this works really well. So that's some of the data that you get from, um, there's some additional tricks in terms of um, embedding nearest neighbor that I didn't go into. Um, so, but that's just the, the, the results that they have. And they're comparing that with cross-lingual supervision and without any supervision, which is their own method. Um, and it's really surprisingly, they could get to competitive performance with using ground truth data of actual pairs. Um, so this, again, like this is not as complex as translating whole sentences. This is only translating words. But I, I still see this as um, very impressive that this can work at all and become very competitive with supervised methods. So then the next part of this is, um, again, another paper from Facebook is, um, now you can actually leverage all three of the core principles that we have covered so far. You can look at, so they use word level alignment, meaning they started from what we just looked at, the unsupervised, level, the unsupervised word level alignment. So this is, you're not just looking at sentence level, you're looking inside sentence to subcomponent level statistics. And then they also use a monolingual language models to make sure what you translate actually looks like a real uh, uh, sentence so that basically you can see that as marginal matching. Uh, and then they also have this thing called black translation, which is another variant of cycle consistency. So you translate it from English to French and then French back to English, you, get, you should get back the same sentence. Um, and this is a paper that essentially utilizes all these three uh, 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 methods. And then from there, I, can, I think they get um, state-of-the-art unsupervised machine translation results that are, um, I think, 10. I don't remember the precise results, but that were um, widely beyond previous state-of-the-art. And these are some of the ablation of showing how many training sentences they use to, in order to surpass um, this kind of um, um, system. So you can see that um, you would need probably somewhere between um, half a million data in order to, for it to surpass the flat line, which is the unsupervised machine translation um, results. Um, so that's that for that method. And so again, like these, none of the kind of principles that we have talked about so far are bulletproof. Um, but I think what's really interesting is you can seemingly extract training signal out of nowhere by just carefully considering the problems of what are the invariances that you can exploit. And especially in NLP, like really thinking about how um, thinking about it not at a random variable level, but really look inside each random variable and what are some additional co-occurring statistics that you can employ um, that could actually help you learn better. So that's that for this part of the lecture. Should we have pizza break? <laughs>